All right. So where we left off was we were talking about biases in our sample, but we eventually need to use our sample to make inferences about our population. So to further understand this, we, we're going to dive into, okay, I, in practice, yes, in this, so this chapter is a little weird um, because once we're past it, we were like, oh, well, you'll usually only have one sample. But we're going to imagine a world where I can take many, 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 many samples, right? So let's say, uh, you know, I'm interested in the average income in the U.S. Take a random sample of 100 people. I calculate the sample mean, write that number down. Randomly sample another 100 people. Calculate the sample mean, write that number down. Randomly I select another 100. I keep doing that. Eventually, I might have like a thousand different samples. If I then graph out what the distribution of those sample means looks like, we're going to have some, some interesting properties. So a sample mean will have its own distribution. Now, what that distribution looks like right, will depend on our sample size, lowercase n. Okay. Um, so what can we say about this distribution? Right. So if we take a sample of size lowercase n, right, some subset of the population, and the population data has a population mean and a population variance, like given by mu and, and sigma squared here, the mean of our sample means. So we have those a thousand different sample mean income values. If I took the mean of those a thousand different sample means, what I'll end up finding is it's the exact same as the population mean. And I've got kind of a thing in Excel I'll show you here to kind of prove this to ourselves with data. But, you know, you can find, you can Google the, the mathematical proof for this as well. And it kind of makes sense, right? Like we just keep on taking random samples. Yeah, sometimes we're going to find a sample mean that's a little bit higher than the population mean. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit lower. But on average, it's going to be centered around whatever that true population mean is, okay? Now, our variance, and I think this will be make a little more sense here in a second, but our variance isn't going to simply be the variance of the distribution, right? It's going to be the variance of our population distribution divided by our sample size. So the variance on our sample mean distribution is going to be a function of our sample size. And this makes sense because if I'm taking samples of size one, well then yeah, I could see really, really high values, really, really low values for income. But if I'm taking a sample of size 100, it's very unlikely I'll see a average income of 150,000. Or it's very unlikely I'll see an average income there, a sample mean income of 100,000 even. So anytime I have larger samples, I'm getting kind of intuitively, this isn't technically quite correct, but I'm getting a larger part of the overall population. So my sample mean should be a lot closer to what that true population mean is. Or the distribution of my sample means is going to be a lot tighter around that true population mean. Okay. So you can kind of notice here, as n goes up, my fraction gets smaller. So the higher the populate, sorry, the higher the sample size, the lower the variance on my sample sample means. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the variation that exists in my sample means is also a direct byproduct of the variance that exists in the original data I sampled from. So um, just to kind of summarize that I've already said this, but you know, as the population variance increases, so will the variance of my sample means. As n increases, the variance on my sample means actually goes down. Um, if I wanted the standard deviation, I kind of wrote this here because we'll start looking at it slightly different ways. It's just the square root of the variance. But you know, if I take the square root of something squared, we can also rewrite this as just sigma over the square root of n. So I'll kind of use both formats depending on what information we're given, um, but they both would equate to the same thing. Okay. Um, and in order for these these uh, formulas to, to work, um, technically, we should have a population that's greater than 20 times our sample size. So this would be the idea of, I need to make sure that my sample isn't too large in order for this to hold. Right? Um, and we won't dive into why it's the case, but that rule of thumb, we do need that to be true. But I mean, usually we don't have more than a 20th uh, of our population you usually have something much much smaller right even a couple thousand people think about the u.s very very small percent of the old population i'm not close to 100 120 um so we think about an example right how can i take a, a normally distributed variable and I, I sample from it what will my sample mean distribution look like 
So if I looked at all the babies born in the Indiana in 2004, some old data set I have, um, the average birth weight is th about 3,287 grams. I rounded the variance just to make it a little bit nicer and easy to work with. But let's say the variance on that, that is 360,000. If I sample 36 babies, and let's say I did that, calculated the sample mean birth weight, I took another 36 random babies, calculated the sample mean birth weight. I do that over and over and over and over and over and over again. I've got a thousand different sample means. I then kind of look at what does the distribution look like for those sample means. What should be true is whatever variable I was starting out with. So here was my normally distributed variable around this mean of 3,287 and a variance of 360,000, right? If I think about, okay, what does the distribution of my sample means look like? Well, now we haven't quite gotten here yet, but as long as I have a sample size over 30, what we're eventually gonna say is my sample means, as long as I get that sample size over 30, will also be normally distributed, okay? Not only will they be normally distributed, they'll be centered around or the mean of my sample means will be whatever that population mean was. Now, I didn't quite draw this to scale because what's going to be true about the distribution of my sample means, well, remember, the variance of my sample means is the original variance from the data I sampled from over my sample size. It should always be, you know, as long as I have a sample size above one, my variance on the sample means should always be a little bit lower than before. In fact, here, I okay, get what? 10,000 if I'm doing math in my head correct here. Right? So a much, much lower variance. So I'm gonna have a more peaked distribution, okay? So this is the idea of what we're doing, right? So let's go back over here. So if I go ahead and compute that, well, I had the variance was 10,000. I take the square root of that, I would have 100, or I could calculate the standard deviation this way, where I take the standard deviation from the population. So square root of the variance would be 600 divided by the square root of my sample size, and I get the same value of 100, okay? Um, what if instead I took a sample of 100 babies, right? So here, you know, hopefully the first part's easy. Anytime I have a sample, it's always going to have a, the mean of those sample means will be whatever that population mean is. So if I'm thinking instead, I've got this here. Here I had a variance of 10,000. If I have a, instead of 36, I have 100 as my sample size. What's going to happen to that variance? Well, if my denominator gets larger, that variance when my samples are of size 100, this is going to be a little bit lower. If I have a lower variance, that means the data is less spread out. It's more likely that I'm going to see values centered around that population mean, less likely I see values further away from. It. So the higher the sample size, the more peaked the distribution is getting because we're reducing the variance. Right? Now, the actual math, if I go ahead and do this, all I'm going to do everything I did before, except for instead of 36. Oh, I chose the wrong one. Hold on. <laughs> uh, instead of 36, I'm now going to be using 100, right? So if I plug that in, um, I've got what? 360,000, oops, divided by 100 is, oh, 3,600. Take the square root of that. I'm at what, 60? So it should be C here, standard deviation is 60. Um, but it's just a matter of plugging the, the same values in. So what's going to happen, right? So here's my population data. As I take higher and higher samples going from 5 to 50, that should reduce right my standard deviation or reduce my variance, making the distribution much more, come on, much more peaked, right? So larger samples, I'm getting a much narrower, kind of more peaked distribution for these sample means which kind of makes sense. I'm getting a larger portion of the overall data with a higher sample size. So more observations is generally better. I can get a better estimate where the population mean is, okay? Um, 
kind of notice here, just another visual, you know, if I take samples of size one, you know, I could see the values all over the place, all pretty equally as likely here, right? Seeing anything between zero and hundred, as soon as I get to a sample size of three, it's kind of hard to see, but it starts to look like a normal distribution, right? And it's more likely that I'm going to see a sample mean that's around what the true mean of 50 is. And I take a sample of size 10. Now it's even more likely, right? That probability, the area under the curve has increased around that mean. Take a sample size 50. Now the probability that I see something close to 50, very, very large. So the higher the sample size, the lower the variance, which means our sample mean is more likely, right? Or has a higher probability of being close to what the sample, or sorry, what the population mean actually is, okay? So what happens if the variable that we start out with isn't normally distributed, right? As long as the variable we start out sampling from is normally distributed, so this is things like human height, weight, as long as it's normally distributed, our sample means will be normally distributed, even if we only have sample sizes of, say, 5 or 10, right? If it isn't normally distributed, so I don't know, this is tons of things that aren't normally distributed. Um, income is a good one. <laughs> um, well, there, it doesn't actually matter. The distribution of my sample means follows the same properties. They'll still be normally distributed around whatever that true population mean is. The variance will be whatever the variance on the data you sampled from was divided by your sample size. As long as you have a sample size over 30. So we call this, there's, you know, there's a, a mathematical proof. You could Google central limit theorem proof, but essentially, as long as we can get a sample size over 30, we know that our sample means will be normally distributed. Now, it's not a perfect normal distribution. It's very close. And the higher the sample size gets, the closer and closer we get to being an exact normal distribution. But anything over 30, it's approximately close enough, we're going to be off at a pretty far decimal. So, you know, just a visual of this, I have different starting distributions. None of these are normal, right? Here we actually, this one would be called, we call it uniform. Everything's equally as likely. Weird right skew, weird left skew, kind of this parabola, kind of, kind of maybe bimodal, I guess you could call that technically. So no matter what distribution we start out with. If we take samples of size two, well, here we get some like really goofy looking distributions. None of these look normal. Right? I guess this one's starting to kind of look normal. It's, you know, a triangle, but it's close. If I then go taking samples of size six, notice everything's looking pretty close to a normal distribution already. Now, this one's still a little bit skewed. You can kind of see the mean here isn't quite at the, at the peak. So we don't really quite have a normal distribution yet. But by the time I get to 30, I've got distributions that are having whatever the mean of the original distribution was centered around that mean, but normally distributed around that mean. So once we get to that sample size of 30, we know that our sample means will be normally distributed. I can kind of take a look at, I had some birth data. Uh, I'll also show you some grade data, prove this to you here uh, in the Excel portion of the video. But uh, yeah, I had some some old birth data, um, recorded birth weight, length of the pregnancy or gestation, APGAR, which is like this health score as soon as the baby's born, and then whether or not the mother smoked while uh, during the pregnancy. Oh, my cat makes an appearance again. Um, so here's the original population data. I had every single birth in Indiana. So, hey. so I had every single birth. So I could take that data set pretty easily calculate the, the number using the count function, mean using the average function, standard deviation using the stdev.p function, right? population standard deviation. So here's the original population means, here's the original population standard deviations, right? I could also kind of look at what the original distributions look like. So again, we have this biological marker, um, birth weight, very close to a normal distribution. Uh, length of the pregnancy, kind of a left skew distribution. We've got like more premature births, not a lot of babies being born at like 11, 10 months. <laughs> um, same kind of thing with a health score, tend to have healthier babies, kind of this long left tail, short right tail. Excuse me. Um, so if I did sample from these births, and that's what I did. And I'll show you in Excel how to do this. And I'll show you in a program called Stata. I won't expect you guys to use it, but I'm trying to maybe pique your interest a little bit um, for maybe taking 371, which is the class after this. So 
I randomly selected a hundred of the births. I then calculated the sample mean birth weight, length of the pregnancy, APGAR score, maternal smoking, whether or not the mother smoked, right? Or the proportion of mothers who smoked during their pregnancy. I did this a thousand times. So I had a thousand different sample means for every single variable. I'm then going to look at what does the distribution of those sample means look like? Well, I had a sample of size 100. So if what I told you before is true, all of these sample means should be normally distributed around, I'm going to go back a ways now, around whatever the true population mean is. And the standard deviation will be the original standard deviation divided by the square root of n. If n was 100, the square root of n would be that divided by 10. So the decimal should just move one place. Okay. So let's see if that was the case, right? So I have my thousand sample means, I calculated the mean, and sure enough, I mean, obviously, in order for it to truly be exactly the same, I'm going to have to take like an infinite number of samples, like this is the, the, you know, kind of the thought experiment, I'm trying to prove this to you with data, taking a large number of samples, it really only holds if I could have like an infinite number of samples. But even at a thousand, right, it's really just a rounding thing, I pretty much the mean of my sample means is the same as the population mean. Same kind of idea for the length of the pregnancy. The mean of my sample means pretty much exactly the same as my population mean. Proportion of mothers who smoke, which this was also alarming, that 18% of mothers at least reported smoking at some point during pregnancy. You know, maybe this was before they knew they were pregnant, but still. Um, and then the health rating, I get exactly the matchup. Once again, the standard deviation should be the original standard deviation divided by 10. So 600 should become 60, 2.66 should be 0.266, which rounds to 0.27, 0 0.38 should be 0 0.038, which rounds to 0 0.04, 0 0.08, or 8.82 should be 0 0.082, sure enough, I'm, everything's holding. Now, I also told you that the distributions will be normally distributed. Here is the distribution of my sample means. So I want to point a couple of things out. First of all, definitely normally distributed, right? And I'm really only seeing sample means between what, 3,075 and like 3,500. Notice this distribution should be centered around the same value, kind of the same, almost, you know, 3,300 as the original population data. But because I'm taking a, a sample, it's not going to be as spread out, right? I'm dividing the original variance by N. So it should be a lot more narrow. Sure enough, if I go back, look at the original birth weight, still centered, right? 32 to 3,500. The other one, I was like, you know, right around 3,300. So that's about right. But notice here, I could see if I'm looking at any one birth, 500 all the way up to 5,000. So that distribution for my sample mean birth weight is going to be much lower, right? This is the idea. If I just looked at one person and tried to use their birth weight as what the, you know, a good idea about what the mean birth weight is, well, it could be way far off. But if I take 100 different births, it's very unlikely I'm going to be very far away from the true mean. Length of the pregnancy, once again, much narrower kind of uh, distribution or much more peak distribution. Looks pretty normal. Yeah, maybe a little bit of a left skew tilt still to the health score, but pretty close to normal. And even the maternal smoking variable, which originally, what was the distribution of it? Did it look like? Well, it was just a zero one. That started out, we didn't even have like a truly continuous variable. Um, but these sample means that we calculate, you can find these proportions, though they were truly continuous. And what ends up being true is those sample means for the proportion of mothers who smoked ends up being very close to a normal distribution as well. Okay. All right. So the steps behind what we're doing, all right, we first need to determine what's the distribution of our sample means look like? It's is does the central limit of the theorem apply? Do I have more than 30 observations? If I do, I know that the sample means will be normally distributed. The mean of those sample means will be the population mean, and the variance of those sample means will be the original variance of the data I sampled from divided by the sample size. I'm then going to turn different values for the sample mean into a z-score or into a standard normal distribution. So here's where it gets a little bit different. Right? So it's the same formula that we used before. It's just that when I want to find the, well, give you a comparison. When I want to find the z-score for a sample mean value, so how do we, for any normal distribution, how do we find a z-score? We said we would take the value for that random variable x divided by, sorry, subtract the uh, mean divided by the standard deviation. If instead, I'm wanting to find a z-score for the sample mean, 
I'm going to take a specific value for the sample mean, subtract the mean of my sample means, and divide by standard deviation of my sample means. The mean of my sample means, though, we know as long as I have a sample size over 30, is just the population mean. And here, that standard deviation of my sample means is simply going to be the original standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So that's why it looks a little bit different. It's really the same format. It's just to calculate the standard deviation of a sample mean, we have a little more work to do. Okay. All right. So the next step, what region are we looking for? Now it starts to look very similar to what we were doing with random variables X. And then, you know, maybe, uh, so I look up the relevant probabilities and maybe I have a little bit of work to do afterwards. So if I want to say the probability, I see a sample mean above 38, I can find the probability using that standard normal table or using the built-in z or norm.s.dis function Excel. I can find the probability that it's less than that value and then one minus to find the probability it's greater than. So, oh, I guess these are a little bit off. I don't know why. <laughs> Sometimes I think uh, versions of my PowerPoint are updating and, and they quite, quite switch everything over. Okay. So... Let's think of an example. So this is kind of looks similar to what we were doing in a previous example um, from a different chapter, but let's say I have this variable and it's normally distributed, has a mean of five, variance of 2,500. I take a sample of 100 people. What's the probability I see a sample mean in between 10 and 15? Okay. So the very first thing I'm going to do is turn those sample mean values into z-scores. How will I do that? Well, I'm going to take whatever that sample mean value is, so 10, subtract the mean of my sample means, which is just the population mean of five, divide by the standard deviation of my sample means, which is just the square root of the variance. And the variance of my sample means will be the variance of the original data I sampled from divided by my sample size. So if I go ahead and do that for both the values of 10 and 15, I end up finding z-scores of one and two, okay? So what's the probability I'm somewhere in between one and two standard deviations? I think about, I could draw this out. What region am I looking for? I want the area in between one and two. I look up that Z value of one and two in the tables. The probability it's two or less, 0.977. Probability that it's one or less, 0 0.8413. Subtract that smaller area from the larger area to be left with just that area in between the two, right? And we did this in Excel. We would do it the exact same way, right? Norm.s, you know, once we find those Z values, norm.s.dist1, comma 1, that would give me this 0.8413. Norm.s.dist2, comma 1 to make it cumulative, 0.9772, okay? And then here we had a little bit of work to do, right? Once we found those probabilities, I have to subtract that smaller area from the overall larger, oops, blue area. There we go, okay? So once we convert to z-scores, it looks pretty similar to what we were doing before, really. Um, we'll go through another example. What is the probability, let's say I have this birth data and I look at 81 different births, what's the probability um, that the length of the pregnancy or gestation weeks, the mean was 39, the variance was nine, I take 81 births, what's the probability I see a sample mean above 39 and a half? Well, you're like, gosh, seems like that should be a pretty large probability. Like, cause I'm pretty far, I mean, or sorry, I'm not very far away from the true mean, right? So if I'm looking at this before I calculate it, maybe I'm like, yeah, that's pretty, probably one of these higher values. A seems way too small, right? But if I think about this, okay, I'm taking this, this sample, um, You know, I'm not very far away from the mean, so it seems like the area to the right could be kind of large. If I take a sample over 30, which this is, sample size 81, I know that the distribution of my sample means, oops, sorry, it will be centered around that population mean of 39, but the variance will be the original variance of 9 divided by 81. So my new variance is one ninth. So my variance is really small. In fact, if I transform this 39.5 value into a z-score, yes, it's only 0.5 away from that population mean, but my standard deviation of my sample means, the square, come on, the square root of one ninth is what, 181st? 
So being 0.5 away is actually 1.5 standard deviations away. So when we're looking at sample means, even small differences from that population mean might be a large number of standard deviations away. So what region am I looking for? I want the area to the, I don't think I have this on. Uh, do I have this? Yeah, there we go. I didn't know if I had, had a visual. So um, what region am I looking for? I want the area to the right of 1.5. If I look up that Z value on the table or use the function in Excel, 1.5, the area to the left, I find will be 0.9332. Over the area to the right, area into the curve is one. So just one minus that. And I actually end up with even being barely away from that population mean, pretty small probability there in that right tail. And just a reminder, um, well, I had Excel, right, where, there it is. This is what we'll look at later. I just want to do a little bit of work for you here. So just a reminder. I have that Z value of 1.5. You know, this is actually one thing. Instead of even using a calculator, so let's say I had this kind of set up. Right now. So I can see everything. So what I could do is say, okay, here's my mean, here's my original variance, here's my sample size, right? So we started out, we were sampling from a variable that had a mean of 39, variance of nine, sample size we took was 81. So what is for my sample means, oops, if I can type, <laughs> sample means, what is the mean of my sample means? What is the standard deviation of my sample means? Well, the mean of my sample means is just that population mean, Standard deviation of my sample means will be the original. Actually, here, I'll do variance first. The variance of my sample means will be the original variance divided by my sample size. Standard deviation, just the square root of the variance. Okay. So 0.33 repeated. I then could calculate my Z score for the value that I'm interested in. So here, I'm actually just going to use a cell reference minus the mean divided by standard deviation of my sample means. Hit enter. I didn't put a value in here yet. The value we had was 1.35. Oh, I missed it. <laughs> it was 39.5. Oh, come on. So I get that Z value of 1.5. I then want to find, okay, what was the probability I saw that Z score or anything less than that? I can use that norm.s.dist function. Tell it that Z value comma one, I get 0.9332. I wanted the probability of being greater than that. So one minus. Now, one thing here, just to point out, I can kind of skip the z-score step, similar to what I was doing before with random variables. If I instead just use the norm.dist function, I'll tell it the cutoff value I'm interested in. I need to tell it the mean of my sample means, and then the standard deviation, I I'm, bleh, standard deviation I'm telling it needs to be the standard deviation of my sample means, so not if I had a standard deviation up here, but the standard deviation of my sample means, comma one, sure enough, I get the exact same probability. And you know, if I set it up this way, if I then kind of switch it, okay, well, I know it's pretty unlikely that I see a length of, you know, a pregnancy go more, more than 30, or have a sample mean more than 39.5, what about 40? Really unlikely. Well, what about 39.2? Eh, not quite as unlikely. Right. So I can kind of just play around with these different values. Okay. All right. So did that one. So the next thing we'll look at is we got some issues if we have finite populations. So most of the populations we deal with are finite. And when it comes to the homeworks or, or exams, I'll... Um, kind of specify when I want you to use this. 
but sometimes with finite pop, if it's not clear if it's a large or or a, you know infinite or a finite population um but if we have a really large proportion of the population um in our sample right we actually need to correct for for that right so the larger the proportion that we have of the the population the smaller the standard error is going to be on our sampling distribution so uh, hold, hold on we'll go through it a little bit more but for right now just know that if we have um a larger portion of the population in our sample our standard deviation is going to be much smaller on our sampling distribution and that kind of makes sense we've got a larger portion of the data we should, we should kind of you know be less likely to see values that are further from the mean so if that ratio if n um the sample size lowercase n over the population size uppercase n is greater than 0 0.05 we need to make a standard error um, adjustment okay so this is kind of similar to that rule of thumb i said that uh, it needed to be at least like 120 or couldn't be more than 120th here if it is more than 120th right or one over 20 is 0 0.05 we have to make an adjustment so we call this the finite population correction factor um and we're going to have to apply it to determine the actual standard deviation on our sample mean so the standard deviation of our sample mean before was just the standard deviation of the data we sampled from divided by our sample size sorry square root of our sample size here is our correction factor notice n minus our sample and then n minus one this numerator will always be as long as i have a sample higher than one right this would always be a value less than one the square root of a value less than one is going to be less than one right and so this correction factor will always reduce the standard deviation of our sample means okay now the larger our sample gets the closer this value is going to get to zero, right? So let's say I had like a sample, a population of size 200, and I had 100 in my sample. Well, it's going to be like, what, 100 over 199, 0.5, take the, the square root of that. Um, so what squared is 0.5? I don't even know off the top of my head, but whatever that value is, I'm getting values closer and closer to zero, which means as I get higher sample sizes, I'm going to get standard deviations on my sample mean that are lower and lower, okay? And... Just to be clear, I thought I had this set up in my eyeballs. Sometimes don't work. It's just this portion is the is the correction factor. Okay. All right. So um also want to say, oh, I kind of just built this out just to kind of show you different sample sizes. So I took different sample sizes, 25, 50, 75, 100. Um, if the population was a hundred. So notice here if I were to take a bunch of these different samples um the standard error that i would calculate so let's say uh i have the original standard deviation of one i would divide it by the square root of my sample size so one over the square root of 25 i'm oh, sorry gives me 0.2 one over the square root of 50 gives me 0.14 etc okay my correction factor, notice, as my sample size gets larger, my correction factor is getting closer and closer to zero. If I did have a population, sorry, if I did have a sample that was the exact same size as my population, like I do here, my correction factor becomes, well, n minus n would be, if they're both 100, zero, zero times anything, I end up with a sample or a correction factor of zero when my sample size is the population and that makes sense I, i'm not going to have any variation if i take a sample that's the same size as the i have all the population data i'll never find anything other than the population mean um so you'll notice here though for all of these smaller sample sizes here was the original standard deviation or our standard error calculation we would make and all the standard error uh sorry i, I probably should have mentioned this term it's just another way of saying the standard deviation of our sample means. Okay. Um, but notice that standard deviation of our sample means or the standard error, once I apply the correction factor, they all are reduced. Okay. So why is this the case? Well, we, go, we went back already looked at this. Right? I mean, if I've got all the population data, I can't see anything other than the population mean. There will be no variation in what I see. Okay. So let's go back to our 
example before and say, okay, we have um, 250 total births in Bloomington. And let's say this is where we have the 81 infants. They've got the mean length of the pregnancy for these infants was 39 weeks, variance of nine. What's the probability that I saw from my sample, a sample mean above 39.5? Well, everything's going to look very similar to what we were doing before, right? More than sample size greater than 30. So we know it's normally distributed, but I determined my standard error. But now it's not just the square root of the original variance over my sample size. That was going to be the standard deviation without the correction factor. My correction factor is, and here, I don't think my number lines up quite right. I probably have a typo here. This was supposed to be 200 births. There we go. So 200 births, right? Um, which if we take that ratio, I have way more than a 20th, right, of, of the population. So once I apply this correction factor, I get 0.2579, right? I transform then that value of 39.5 into a z-score. So take that value subtract the mean, divide by my standard deviation with the correction factor. I look 1.95 up in the table. I find the area to the left is 0.9738. Remember, we wanted the area to the right or the probability we saw the pregnancy be longer than 39 and a half weeks. Now that probability is 0 0.0262, which notice compared to before, if I can get it up here, right? 0 0.06 is gonna be a smaller value, right? So compared to before when we didn't have the correction factor, once we applied the correction factor to our standard error or the standard deviation of our sample means, we get a probability that's a little bit lower, okay? All right, um, the last kind of topic we have for this, this section is going to be sample proportions, okay? So the sample proportion is really just a unique example of the sample mean, right? So I already talked about proportions, right? Um, but we'll kind of try to relate this. So proportions is the idea of like, if I had 100 people, 20 of them uh, smoked while pregnant, uh, the sample portion or the proportion there would be 0 0.2, 20 over 100. If you go back and remember the binomial distribution, I had that the mean of my binomial distribution was n times p. And I had that the variance was n times p times q or times one minus p. I can actually look at samples from this binomial distribution as well. So successes and failures, right? So what will end up being true is the mean of my sample proportion. So if I looked at, say, 100 people and saw how many people smoked while pregnant, I did another random 100 people, I collected that. What will end up being true is the mean of those sample proportions will be centered around just like with the mean of my sample means it'll be centered around the true or sorry just like the mean of my sample means was centered around the true population mean the mean of my sample proportions will be centered around the true population proportion and then the variance of my sample proportions will be the original kind of variance in my my sample proportions so remember my original variance here kind of p times one minus p because this was like the the number of of uh um, this was for finding the variance on the number of occurrences. Now we're not looking at the number of occurrences, but the proportion of occurrences. So um, kind of drop the N here. And then I have to divide by my sample size, just like I did for the sample mean. Okay. So the intuition there is, you know, if I'm thinking about here before I was looking at the number of successes, now I want the proportion of successes. So if n times p is the number of successes, if I divide that by the number of trials, that would give me to the proportion. Ns would cancel, I'd be just left with p. Same kind of idea here, ends would cancel. I'm left with p times one minus p, okay? Um, I then, you know, I've got the mean of this sample statistic. I have the variance, which I can then calculate the standard deviation of the sample statistic my z-score formula, I'm just gonna take different values for the sample proportion, subtract that mean of my sample proportions, which is the true population portion, divide by the standard deviation of this statistic, which is just this. So what does this look like in practice, right? So let's say I'm flipping a coin 100 times, right? 
So if I flip this coin 100 times, what's the probability that I got 55 or more to come up heads? So I'm wondering, out of a sample size of 100, what's the probability that I see a sample proportion of, well, 55 out of 100, my sample proportion here would be 0.55, right? So I'll take that sample proportion, 0.55, I'll subtract the true population proportion. Well, if I have a fair coin, I know that if I could flip it enough times, probability comes up heads, it'll always come up heads 50% of the time or a probability of 0.5. I then use that population proportion down here, 0.5 times one minus 0.5 to calculate kind of the variance, right? In that original population proportion. I divide it by my sample size. That gives me the variance of my sample proportions. Taking the square root gives me the standard deviation. Well, that's what I needed to divide by to get my z-score. So here I'd have a z-value of one. I looked that value up in the table. We should be, once again, I'm using one a lot of the time, so we can get kind of used to seeing this. But if I, I wanted to, I couldn't remember what this was from an earlier problem. Norm.s.dist one comma one. We're looking for a cumulative probability. 0.8413. I wanted the probability of seeing 55 or more. So anytime I have that greater than, I have to do one more step. Okay. All right. So let's look at another example. So if I had 66 out of 144, right? So now I'm thinking about, well, what is my sample proportion? It's 66 divided by 144. I'm then going to subtract that true population proportion of 0.5. If I do that, I get this value. I'm then going to divide by the standard deviation of my sample proportion. So I'm still using that population proportion of 0.5 down here, but now my sample size is 144. Well, here I end up with a z value of negative one. I don't even have to use the table, right? Because we just found the area to the right of a z score of positive one is 0.1587, which remember, Standard normal distribution is symmetric, so the area to the right of positive one should be the same as the area to the left of negative one. Right? But once again, I know the area to the left of negative one is 0.1587, but the original question was, what's the probability I see 66 or more? So I have one more final step, oh, sorry, which is to subtract it from one. Okay. Um, we can also apply the correction factor to these proportion examples as well. So let's say uh, in 2020, the proportion, uh, oh wait, this doesn't seem right. Hold on, oh, let me make sure that this lines up. I'm sure I'm at 0 0.056. Oh, no, actually I think uh, this was right, sorry. Yeah, this isn't the proportion of people. <laughs> so this is the proportion of counties in 2020 that actually um, had more votes for Trump. Um, so of the 92 counties, uh, there was only a proportion of 0 0.056 that actually voted for, for Trump in Indiana. Um, you take a sample of a random 32 countries and you find a sample proportion of 0 0.09. Okay. So what's the probability you saw a sample proportion as high as you did or higher? Well, I've got 32 of the 92 counties. That's way more than 1 20th. So I need to apply this correction factor. Okay. So is my sample size greater than 30? Yes. So I know that these sample proportions will be normally distributed. But I'm going to have to first calculate my standard error. Oh, sorry. We're going to start this one over. 